I was in Nashville, so I went to school here, moved down to Franklin and was looking for a church home and had kind of visited around and never really committed anywhere. And I had a good friend of mine who called me up one Saturday and said, hey, I'm playing in a three-on-three basketball tournament in Cool Springs uh, at the movie theater. Why don't you come out and watch me play? And so I didn't have anything better to do on a Saturday than sit on a couch and be lazy. So I went down and uh, watched him play and, and kind of spent the day wandering around the parking lot. And then this guy comes up to me and you know, starts talking and we talk about you know the San Antonio Spurs and basketball and Nashville and all the fun stuff going on. He said, by the way, you know, we, the, we meet here for church in the movie theater here next door. And, uh, you know, if you, if you want to come check us out on a Sunday, I'd love, love to have you. And, and then at the end of the conversation, he said, by the way, don't, don't get weirded out if, if I'm down front, you know, preaching because I'm actually the pastor here. And so, um, I mean, that was my hook. And I came the next Sunday and, um, and had a great experience. We just, we've been here ever since. You know, I remember watching movies there and sticking around some Sundays to, to you know, to catch a movie and he'd smell the popcorn. And I also remember the, the staff and the crew that would set up and you saw the trucks parked, you know, on the side of the building and people just hustling and running. And there was just an energy to the church and kind of a, an authenticity and a grit that I hadn't seen before. And uh, it was just pretty cool. One of the many things I love about what we do is we meet people where, where they are and um, where, where I was that day was at a basketball tournament. I, I, was, I was not there for church and I was not there to meet anybody to go to church and, it, and, and God worked through that to, to kind of bring me here. And so for us reaching out either through a PATH project or you know, overseas missions or through three on three basketball, it's meeting people where they are. It's going into their communities and, it, and it's, it's helping on a personal one on one level. And it's about just kind of being good people in our community and out of that, I think, um, comes opportunities to invite people to church or not, or just to be a, a a good neighbor and help out and that's what we're called to do we've grown and we've got some nicer stuff and we've got some cooler toys and we've got a lot more people um, but at the end of the day it still comes back to that same um, worship mentality and, and community and, and all the things that we kind of put first in, as a church uh, are all the things that were put first at the movie theater days Uh, well, good morning, church. Good morning. What a great day. Great day to be together, to worship together. And we're in the middle of an awesome series called Rooted. And in this series, we're talking about us as a church and kind of the roots of the church and what God's been doing here at Rolling Hills, but also in your life. What are the roots? What's important to you? Where are you investing your heart and investing your life? You know, this is our 15th anniversary as a church. I mean, we started 15 years ago. We had 15 people in an apartment clubhouse doing a Bible study on Thursday nights, and then it, it started to grow, and, and God has been moving in a powerful way, I and mean, we're just so excited, just hanging on to Him. And what I love about anniversaries, is anniversaries are a great way for us to kind of look back and to think. And so many of you, you're going to have an anniversary this year, and you're going to have a birthday or an opportunity, and it, it gives you a month to kind of look back and to celebrate. So the first thing that we see is this, is that remember where you've been. Anniversaries are a great place for you to kind of remember where you've been. And when you have a wedding anniversary that's coming up this year, some people like to eat a piece of their wedding cake, you know, like, on their, like how long does that stay good? I don't know. But I mean, like, like people do that kind of thing or, or you watch your wedding video or you kind of, you know, go back and eat at the same restaurant or something. I don't know what it is. But what I love about that is you're kind of going, hey, I want to remember, you know, those feelings. I want to remember kind of that love that we had. And those things are important when you do that. The second thing when you're celebrating an anniversary or a birthday is this, is to kind of evaluate where you are today. You know, it's a great opportunity when you have a work anniversary and you like have been at the same job for a year or five years or 10 years or 15 years and you kind of go, okay, am I at the right place? You know, I've been here for a while. Is, is this where I need to be? Is this, am I headed in the right direction? Am I kind of being here? Is this good? It, it gives you time to evaluate and be honest and be vulnerable and be real in those kind of times. Evaluate where you are instead of just drifting along. And then the third thing it does, it allows you to look forward to all that God will do in the future. And, and that's a great thing. It's kind of this opportunity to kind of go, okay, man, this has been a great 15 years, but, but what's next? You know, what's God going to do now? And so I love that. And, and so as a church last week, we started this series. We kind of looked back. We talked about where we've been. And, and we saw that passage in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter three, as the apostle Paul was planting the church there in Ephesus and says, hey guys, you are rooted and established in love. Okay, don't forget that, right? You are rooted in love. And love is the distinguishing mark of a church. 
And he says, you know, it doesn't matter where you meet. You can meet in different places. But remember that it's about love. Jesus said the most important commandments, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor. And so as a church, right, we've, we've met in an apartment clubhouse. We have met in a hotel ballroom. We've met in a movie theater. We're meeting now in a warehouse. But, but it's not the building. The building's not the vision. The vision's the vision, right? And for us to hold on to Christ and for us to grow deeper in our faith and for us to be men and women after his heart, our vision statement here at Rolling Hills simply says this, a people of God, right, it's all him, it's all for his glory, a people of God reaching out, growing up, and giving all. It, that's what it is, right? People of God reaching out, growing up, maturing in our faith, and, and giving all. Now, there's eight core values that we have that kind of hold us all together. So all the things that you see, they're on the back of your worship guide every week. I don't know whether you ever take a peek at those, but, but these are the things that we kind of value here as a church. Number one is love. Right? I, I love what Jesus said to his disciples. He said in John 13, he said, he said, hey guys, by this, all men will know you're my disciples. If, if you have great Bible studies, oh, that's important, right? If you have great worship, that's important. But, but he said, no, all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. <laughs> he goes, everybody in the world is looking for love. And the way you love each other is going to radiate to the world the way God loves and so you guys be about love. Our second core value is this, to reach, right? We're going to talk more about that this morning. What, what does that mean? What does that look like for us? And, and then the third one is to minister, minister. And we say this, we say every person through Christ is a minister and essential to this body of believers. Now you're going, I'm not a minister, okay? You know, like that's not me. It, but, the, but the truth is when you, the Holy Spirit comes inside, when you give your life to Christ, you are a minister, and some of you, you can do ministry better than I can. I mean, and some of you have the ministry of worship and you, and you can sing. And, and like, I'm terrible at singing, okay? Like if I was leading worship, nobody would be here. I mean, it's just like, you know, and so you are awesome. At some of you have the ministry of, of teaching children. Some of you have the ministry of teaching, you know, small groups. Some of you have the, a ministry at your workplace or writing blogs or different ways that you have to further God's kingdom. But we say every person, right? And sometimes people go, well, no, it's just the staff that does it all. no. I mean, it's through Christ. And so every person is to minister. Our, our fourth one is to grow, grow. And we say this, we, we don't want you to be in the same place spiritually a year from now that you are right now. We want you to grow deeper in Christ. We want you to grow deep roots in Him. We want you to mature in your faith. We'll talk more about that next week. Uh, then core value number five is joy. So this is my wife's favorite one, favorite core value. But church is designed to be enjoyable. Joy will permeate all we do. We want when we come to church to be excited. I mean, it ought to be. Some people grew up in a church, it's like, oh, I gotta go to church, you know? But I love when people go, yeah, I get to go to church, right? When our kids are like, church, it's church day. I can't wait to go. Why? I mean, the God of the universe sent his son for us, right? I mean, Jesus gave his life for us. This ought to be the place that we are so excited. Praise be to God. Look what God's done. For me, our next core value is change. And, and we talk about that, you know. Our message stays the same. It has for 2,000 years, right, the gospel. But our methods change. We don't do church the same way they did in the 50s or the 20s or back in the 1800s or back, you know. It, we have to continue to look at our culture and we have to continue to change. And then this core value of excellence. We want to do things well for the glory of God. All right, we don't want to just go to our workplaces and give our best there and then come to church and go, okay, well, this is all I got left. No, we want to go like, hey, we want to give our best. You know, this is God that we're serving. You know, work is you're working for the Lord and not for men. And then our last core value is this, it's prayer. And, and I love that because prayer undergirds everything that we do. It's God's church. We're God's people. We're seeing God do what only God can do. And that's the great part about being a Christ follower is it's, it's his agenda. When Jesus said, come follow me, and, and he didn't say, hey, where you're going. He didn't say, here's a what to bring list. He just said, come follow and watch what I do. And you just go, okay, I'm gonna hold on to Jesus. <laughs> I'm just gonna walk with Jesus. How fun is this going to be? And so here's what we're talking about today. Kind of where are we as we see a people of God reaching out? What does that mean? So if you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you up with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, and, and we're going to see some of the very last words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 28. 
Now, let me set the stage for you while you're turning there, okay? We just celebrated Christmas, right? Matthew chapter 1, Emmanuel, God with us. When we were dead in our sins and our transgressions, God came to us. So it's not like we have to get all cleaned up to come to God. God came to us. Praise God for his grace, his sovereignty, his goodness in our lives. So Jesus comes. He lives 33 sinless years, right? It's to show us how to live, to show us that all people matter to God, to show us to live a life of love. He washed the disciples' feet to give us an example of servant leadership. And then he dies on a cross for your sins and for my sins to pay the price that we deserve to pay. But here's the good news, right? Death couldn't hold him down. Oh no, our God is alive. And Jesus, after three days, conquered death, the resurrection. And after that, he appeared to over 500 people. And now, right before he ascends back into heaven, he calls his disciples together and he tells them this. Matthew chapter 28, look at verse 18. This is called the Great Commission. Then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Some people go, well, you know, I just don't know what God wants me to do with my life. You know, and I'm like, well, I mean, it's like, I mean it, it, God's going, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I'm telling you. And I love how he starts off. And Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, these guys just watched him resurrect him, right? I and mean, they saw him conquer death. I mean, nobody conquers death, right? Death was a big bully on the block. Everybody was afraid. Jesus conquers death. And he says, okay, guys, all authority. I am sovereign over all that there is. And all authority has been given to me. Therefore, here's what I'm telling you to do. Here's the way I want you to go live. Go. Now, that word go right there is a present participle, okay? It means while you're going, while you're living, you know, while you're at work, while you're at school, while you're in your neighborhood, you go, and he says, and make disciples. Go and make disciples, and not just the people here, but, but of all nations, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is important. Some of you, God's been calling you to take that next step of faith. To be baptized, a public expression of your faith in Christ. And I encourage you in 2018, hey, say, that's something I want to do. But also for us, you know, as parents, and teaching our kids and, and standing with them or, or friends or neighbors, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Right? I, I've been pouring into you. <laughs> I've taught you these things. Some of you have been in Sunday school like all your life, you know, and you've been in small groups. And he's like, I've taught you. Now you go teach others. And, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And listen, surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now, guys, maybe you just need to hear that today. Maybe you walked in the room and, man, it's just it's kind of hard. It's weighty and it's already the beginning of the new year. And you're just like, ah, just hear this. Jesus said, I am with you. I'm with you. I'm for you. And there's times when it gets to be stressful in life and, 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 I, and I get down on my knees and I just pray. And it's like, okay, Jesus, you're with me. That's enough. You're with me. And I don't have to ha know all the answers. I don't have to know all the things that are upcoming. I just, I just know that you're with me. That's good. A and I'm great. And Jesus goes, hey, I want you guys to know this. I'm sending you out, but I want you to know I am with you. Now, here's some things I want you to see today. First of all, I want you to see this. I want you to see Jesus calls all of his disciples to reach out to others. Okay, Jesus is calling all of his disciples to reach out. And a lot of times we're like, ah, not me, right? <laughs> I'll let other people do that. You know, that, that's not me. My, my faith is private. You know, some people say, my, my faith is private. Well, Christianity is a pretty public faith. Okay? Hey, Christianity, now I don't think God's calling us to go, you know, stand at a football game with a big, you know, wig and hold up John 3, 16 or go stand on a street corner with signs. I mean, people want to do that, that that's fine. But, but, God, but God's not calling all of us to do that. But God is calling us to be dialed in with what he's doing in the world. And God is calling us to look around at the people around us and say, how can I just tell people about Jesus? How can I offer love? in grace, in hope. How can I model Christ? And it's not just, hey, let the church staff do that, you know. It, it's all of us. Jesus said, therefore, go. You. And for us just to say, okay, I don't understand how it's all going to work, but 
I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers, but, but I'm yours, God. Whatever you want to do. So the second thing is to know this, is the church is not a country club, okay? The church is not a country club, but the vehicle by which God accomplishes his work in the world. You know, some people think, oh, man, this is awesome. I just come to church. It's like everybody meets my needs. It's all about me. It's, a, it's not a country club. The church is not an organization. The church is an organism. She is alive. And that's the beautiful part of church. And the church is the vehicle by which God accomplishes his work in the world. And when men and women who've gone before us have stepped out of faith, right, and who've started schools and hospice and who started soup kitchens and who've met the needs of people around and who've shared the gospel with others, I mean, that's how God changes the world. Jesus is like, okay, my disciples, you go and spread the love of Christ. You go be the hands and feet. You go make a difference. So we just have to understand that we do that together as the church. Now, here's something that's so powerful and so freeing. It's only God who can change a heart, right? It's not our responsibility to go out and how people respond. That's not up to us. It's only God who changes a heart. God doesn't say, hey, you go out, you know, you, you change all these. God just says, you, you go out and share my love. You, you go out and just... Tell people what I've done in your life. You, you go out and the things that you've learned and let me change hearts. That's the sovereignty of God. And that's where we trust and hold on to him. Now, I love this. Reaching out is simply planting seeds of the gospel. Reaching out is simply planting seeds of the gospel. And, and you guys, we can all do that. It's not that we have to have everything figured out. We don't have to have like, you know, this whole kind of diatribe that we're going to go through with everybody. It, it's just plant seeds. Wherever you are, plant seeds. Jesus told a parable one day. And a parable is an earthly story, you know, with a heavenly meaning. It's the way Jesus taught. Because Jesus was the master teacher. And he loved those aha moments when people kind of figured it out. They're like, oh, yeah. Because you own it, right? The teachers will tell you that. And so, so where he, Jesus is saying, he goes, hey, listen, guys. There was a farmer who went out to sow his field. And back then they have a pouch and they have the seeds in here. And, and Jesus goes, and this farmer goes out and he starts sowing the seed. And they would just throw the seed, they'd throw the seed. And he said, some of the seed, it fell on the road. And the birds came and snatched it away. Some of the seed, it fell among kind of the rocks and started to grow up. But, you know, then it kind of died off and it withered. And, and some of the seed, it fell among the thorns and the thistles. And it just kind of shot up at first and then it, kind of melted away. But, but he said, some of the seed, some of the seed, it fell on good soil. And it grew up and it yielded a harvest 160, 30 fold. Now, I love the disciples because the disciples are like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then after the whole crowd leaves, they come to Jesus. They're like, hey, we don't get it. You know, can you, can you kind of explain it? Like, what is that whole seed thing talking about? And in Matthew 13, Jesus goes, okay, guys, here's the deal. Let me tell you. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed that was sown along the path. All right? So what he's saying is, is sometimes the seed, the seed is the gospel, the seed is the spiritual conversation, the seed is the good news of Christ. Sometimes people's hearts are hard and it, people are like, no, forget it. You know, and Jesus said, that's what's going to happen. He says, the one received the seed that fell in the rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no, what, root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. Because some people are going to go, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, that's great. But then they kind of get caught up in the world and they walk away. And you're like, ah, because they don't have roots. They're not growing deeper. They're not learning. It's about a relationship, right? He says, the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. Now, that's pretty strong right there. I got to tell you, because he says, some people, they hear and they get excited. and They're like, yeah, this is great. This is awesome. But then what are the two things? The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out. And they're like, oh, I'm going to go the way of the world, right? I don't know about you, Jesus. I'm going to go and I'm going to follow the world. And some of you, you know, I mean, you watch on Facebook and stuff. And you're like, man, they used to be active. What happened? Where'd they go? You know, what, what's happening? But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. And he produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Guys, that's you. 
right? Somebody taught you. Somebody poured into you. Somebody shared with you about Christ. And I praise God. I grew up in a Christian home. My parents took me to church. Praise God for the godly parents that are here. But somebody poured into me, and I had teachers along the way who taught me about Jesus. Thank God for that. And in your life, there were people, and maybe it was in college, and somebody took you to have coffee and just said, hey, I see what's going on in your life. I see the direction. I want to tell you there is hope and there's help, and I want to tell you about Jesus. And, and praise God for the people, but you're the one. The seed is planted in your heart, and the call is to yield a harvest. And you're doing that as you live and as you grow deep roots in him. And, and, and the last one on this point is this, that Jesus calls us to share his love both here and around the world, all nations, right? They go and make disciples, Jesus said. And these guys, I mean, they, they, they just went out and they started telling people about Jesus. And if you go in to the book of Acts, it's like the early church. They just started where they were in sharing the love of Christ there. I remember 15 years ago uh, when God called us to plant Rolling Hills and we, we said, how are we gonna reach this community for Christ? All right, I mean, you know, I mean, people who don't know Jesus aren't just showing up for church every week, right? So, so here we are, you know, how are we gonna reach this community for Christ. We started asking that question. There was a couple of guys in our church and we sat down, we were talking about that. And we said, well, one of the biggest passions here in Williamson County is sports. I mean, right, you know it. You go over the soccer fields, they're all packed. You go kids sports, youth sports, Titans, the pre I mean, you know, it, sports was a big deal. So we said, well, what if we do a three-on-three -three basketball tournament? Now, we didn't know what was gonna happen. We just know, hey, let's go out and plant seeds. Let's just go out and share Christ. Let's go out and tell the community that God loves them and let's see what happens. Well, we didn't have a lot of money for it. <laughs> so we went over to Chick-fil-A in Cool Springs. We talked to Bill Fender, who's the owner operator. We set up a little meeting and we sit down with him. And we're sitting in a little booth there at Chick-fil-A and Chick-fil-A's packed, right? And we're, we're saying, hey, what if we do this three-on-three -three tournament? Bill, would you help us? And he said, sounds like a great idea. He goes, you know what? I'll give you $5,000. Now, I got to tell you, like our church budget that first year was like $20,000 for the entire year. So we were like, five, what? Wow. You know, we were like, okay, God, here we go. And so three days before the tournament, though, we had brought basketball goals in from Indiana. We were going to have this big tournament. And three days before the tournament, we had one team signed up. One team. Now, I don't know if you know much about three-on-three -three basketball, but it's kind of hard with one team, you know, just like it doesn't work real well. Like, hey, here's your trophy, you know. I mean, so we, we were like, okay, God. And we started praying, and a couple of guys were like, hey, let's just cancel. Let's just, you know, not, not do it, and let's cancel. And, but we just felt like, no, God said press forward. And so he got one of the basketball goals. We set it up in the parking lot at Chick-fil-A, right? And there's cars coming around, and we were shooting baskets and talking to people. And, and uh, we would give them a free chicken sandwich if they made a basket. And, and you wouldn't believe it. In three days, we had now then 34 teams. And so our first basketball tournament, we had 34 teams who, who came out and played. And it was so awesome. Like, people like Jason and Jessica, people you just got to meet and, and we just had this awesome time. The next year we had 67 teams. And the next year we had 100 teams out in the parking lot at Thoroughbred Theater. And, and what was awesome to see was that was God just saying, hey, as a church, I, I want you not just to have a holy huddle. I want you to be engaged in the community. And you start to meet the most amazing people, right? Well, the two guys, what's really cool, two guys who were in our church, just volunteers who said this was something they felt like was really God put on their hearts. So they went down to corporate at Chick-fil-A in Georgia, and they started talking to Chick-fil-A about doing this with other churches around. And, and the Chick-fil-A corporate said, yeah, we would love to do that. Look, we'll help you. And so these guys like left our church, and they moved down to Athens, Georgia, and they started doing it with other churches. And then they said, hey, what if we did a camp, like a day camp? And so they partnered with Chick-fil-A called Windshape Camps. And this past summer, they had 28,000 kids in 92 different cities across the U.S doing camps, and they had 1,918 kids except Christ. Guys, that's the Lord, right? And God just says, plant seeds. We don't know what God's going to do. This coming summer, we're going to have a wind-shaped camp here. We're going to use the, the field next door that we own, and we're going to have, so if you have elementary kids, it's a great opportunity to come and to invite. And God just said, right here, look around. There's people who need me. But then he said, right, go and make disciples of all nations, and, and as a young church, we were like, well, what does that mean? You know, we're, we're all nations. I mean, we're just like this little church. We're sitting in an apartment clubhouse. And, and this guy calls and says, hey, would you bring a group to Moldova? 
And we said, where's Moldova? You know, like, he's like, it's the poorest, smallest country in the former Soviet Union. But the statistic that got us and it still gets us today is this 60% of girls trafficked into prostitution in Eastern Europe come out of this country of 4 million. And so here's this little church, a little Bible study that's happening. And we said, we need to go. We put it out. Eight months later, 18 people went. And we fell in love with these orphan kids in Moldova. And we started going and seeing God work in their lives. And, and you know, when you go, you go to give and your life is the one who's changed. And the next year we took two trips and the next year we went back at Christmas and taking gifts to orphans and these orphanages all throughout the country. And eight years ago, by God's grace, we started Justice and Mercy International. You see the booth whenever you come in and, and just said, hey, how can we do more? Now we have three houses in Moldova. We owned property in Moldova before we ever owned property in the States. And we just said, you know what? God's called us to make a difference. Now there's 17 full-time people working for JMI in Moldova, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, vocational directors that are helping kids have a hope and a future. Guys, that's you. It's just God says, just plant seeds. Don't just stay inside. Look around. How can you make a difference for the glory of God? And what is so amazing, what's so amazing about this is this, is that the result, the result, when you begin to get out, the result is of reaching out and serving God is joy. It's reaching out and serving God. It's joy. It just happens inside of you. And when you and I begin to engage with what God has called us to do, it just allows us to come alive. You know, when you go to Luke chapter 10, and you can read this later because I don't have time to get into it, but it's so good. But, but Luke chapter 10, Jesus took his disciples, and there were about 72 at this time, and, and he sent them out two by two. And he said, go into the cities before I come in, and you go out and do ministry. And these guys, right, they're fishermen, they're business guys. These aren't like seminary students. These guys are just like, you want us to do what? You know, like, no, you go out two by two. Don't take a purse with you. Don't take a credit card. Don't you just go out and start telling people about my love and my grace. Okay, here we go. And they go off. And you know they're scared to death, right? They're scared to death. But in Luke chapter 10, it says that they all came back. And I love this. Because it says the 72 returned with joy. See, the joy is for you. And God says, when you begin to engage with what I'm doing in the world, there is joy that will happen in your life. I was talking with a guy this morning. He just got back from one of our mission teams that just went to Moldova. And he goes, you know, it's unbelievable. You just come back when you're just so excited. You see the life change that happens and there's joy. I mean, the guy's just lighting up like a Christmas tree. And you're like, yes. And you go to give, but you're the one who's changed. But I love this part as well. Look at this, look at this. It also says that we bring joy to Jesus because when Luke chapter 10, it says at that time, Jesus full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Jesus sees these guys coming back. They're all high-fiving. They're all talking. And Jesus is like, yes, <laughs> they get it, right? They're living it. And I think Jesus is just so fired up and going, okay, God, here we go. I'm going to impact the world through these guys. One of my favorite weekends of the year is upcoming. And uh, it's Super Bowl weekend, February 3rd and 4th. But it's not because of the Super Bowl. It's because of what we do called the Father Sun Bowl. And the Father Sun Bowl was started 11 years ago by a couple in our church, Darren and Carrie Clark. And Darren and Carrie just had a vision for what it means to connect dads and sons. Um, Darren, he'll share his story every year at the Father Sun Bowl. And I, I just love listening to his testimony. But he said, you know, I grew up in a home and my dad and I, we didn't have a great relationship. And he said, I always wanted that. And it just weighed on me. And guys, you know that, right? That connection with your dad's not there. And, and so Darren, then God get, starts giving him boys. And Darren's now the dad of four boys. And so one Sunday after church, some dads and sons go out to play football. And Darren and Carrie start thinking, well, what if we could connect more dads and more sons together? What, what if we could do that? Last year, um, you know, as a church, the whole time we've kind of been coming around them and having volunteers and doing this. And last year, right across the street, the Father's Son Bowl, 10th year was last year. And there were 1,200 fathers and sons out playing football. 1,200. And what was awesome is to see these kids and, and every one of them will come up and they'll say, this is the best day of my life. This is the best day of my life because I'm getting to play with my dad. 
And they're high-fiving, man. One of those little kids will score a touchdown, you know, and there's flags, and he throws the ball down, he's jumping up. I mean, just, and you're just out there. And as a church, we volunteer, and we're out there, and we're doing all kinds of things on the field and refreshments. We're driving carts, and we're high-fiving kids. And every one of us is smiling ear to ear, and we're just like, yes, this is the church being the church. And I love it. And you're seeing life change happen. You're seeing Darren share his testimony and people come to life. And then what's so cool is that Saturday on Sunday is MVP Sunday. And Darren invites all these orphanages from all over, like fatherless kids who come and people drive in from Alabama and homes come in. And and then they get to play with many of the men in our church and they'll get out there and they just like light up and it's awesome. And I'm just like, that's the church. You guys, I love serving our God together. And there's a joy that comes in your heart and your soul. And you know this, right? When you give, when you're generous, when you help out somebody, something happens inside of you because you're dialing in with the plan of God. Now notice this, notice this. In order to accomplish God's will in our life, we must change. (laughs) We must change. We must constantly change. See, everything in our world wants to keep us complacent. Everything in our world wants to kind of bring us in and focus us on ourselves, our needs, right? We have air conditioning to make us comfortable and everything kind of comes in here. But here's what the Apostle Paul says. The Apostle Paul, he says this in 1 Corinthians. He says, listen, I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. The apostle Paul, you know, he just said, hey, God, use me all the days of my life. Use me all the days of my life and I'll continue to change. I'll continue to do whatever God you've called me to do. Some years ago, there was a guy named John Pacalabo. And John Pack was a a rock and roll guy. You know, he grew up in England and he used to have a band and they would open for the Beatles. And, and, and I mean, he, he did really well, made a lot of money. But then in his 30s, he gave his life to Christ. And God just got a hold of his heart. And, and, and he started saying, well, I've got music. And how do I use music to help further the kingdom? And so he started what's called Kingsway Music. And people like Matt Redman and Stuart Town and a lot of the worship movement that came out of England was because of John Pack and his leadership there. Well, when he was 55, he told his wife, Juliet, he said, hey, Juliet, we've done really well. We've made a lot of money. Why don't we buy a villa in Spain? We'll play golf half the year because he loved to play golf, right? And then live in London half the year. It's going to be great. And then that same year, he was on a fishing trip down the Amazon, you know, because you're going to catch, you know, peacock bass. That's the big thing, right? So he's going down the Amazon trying to fish. And he looks over and he sees this dilapidated building. And he says to the guide, what's that? And his guy says, that's a school. And he starts looking at it, and there's about 150 kids crowded in, and it's about 120 degrees outside. And he looked back at her, and he said, that's not a school. And God broke his heart right there in the middle of the Amazon. And he called his wife, Juliet, and he said, sell the villa in Spain. We're investing here. And over the next 10 years, he built a million-dollar community center down in the center of the Amazon He built 15 schools in different villages throughout the Amazon because if you build a school, the government will put a teacher there. And he bought a boat that you could go and do missions in these different villages. And he said, I want my legacy to be what I did for the poor and the forgotten of the Amazon for the glory of God. And I remember John talking and saying, I just wish I would have discovered this earlier. (laughs) I wish I would have known this sooner. About four years ago, John was diagnosed with cancer and he called us and said, hey, would you guys come over? I'd like to talk to you about us partnering together with JMI and doing the work in the Amazon. So some of us flew to London and we met with John and we got there and we went to his house and he was in a hospital bed. He had an oxygen mask on, and, but he had the whole board of Kingsway Music there. He had his children, his grandchildren there. And for three hours, he just transferred all the assets and just said, hey, I wanna be sure this work continues I want my legacy to be what I did for the least and the forgotten for the glory of God. I want my kids to see how much Jesus means to me and the difference we can make together. And we prayed and we worshiped. And I'm sitting there thinking, how in the world is this gonna happen? But God knew. 
After about three hours, he was tired. He said, I'm tired. He closed his eyes and we left for a little bit. We came back the next day. He opened his eyes, looked at his wife, Juliet. And he said, Juliet, I love you. And then he closed his eyes and he died. And he went home to be with Jesus. And I want to tell you, I just saw a man of faith and a man who said, I get it. I just want to live it. I want to plant seeds that are going to impact lives. And the, and the work that God's done there is incredible. And some of you, God may call to go to the Amazon someday. And we're going to take a team. We'll be doing pastor's conferences. We'll continue to do that. But, but it's because of one guy who just said, I just want to live it. In my day and in my generation. I love reading John Piper. And John Piper talks about how, you know, some people just like want to retire and go live at the beach and collect seashells. And like, what are you going to do? Say to God at the end of your life, hey, God, here's my seashell collection. You know, God's like, Really? Look at all the seashells in the world. I've got them all, you know? You're like, I want you to go and share Christ. I want you to go impact lives for my name and for my glory. I want you to join me in what I'm doing in the world. And we have that opportunity. Every day we have that opportunity. I got an email from a, a lady last week in our church, and she said it's our 15th year, and so she kind of recounted her story and how she was at work, and a guy who goes to our church invited her to church. And she said, I was so rude to him, you know, and I, and I know that. But I was jaded from church. She said, I grew up in a church and grew up up north, and I hated church. And when I was a kid, I left, and I said, I'm never going back. And then this guy invites me to come. I told him no. He invited me again. I told him no. He invited me again. I told him no. But then one Sunday, without him knowing, I just showed up. And I remember meeting her. And I remember meeting her that day, and I asked her how she liked it, and she didn't say much, but I was, told her I was glad she was there. And she said, that day I went home, and my brother and my mom were at my house, and they said, where have you been? And I said, I went to church. And they went, what? You went, where? She kept coming back. I saw her a few months later, and I said, how do you like it? She said, I like it okay, but but you know what, I'm not singing. I said, well, why aren't you singing? She goes, I feel like if I sing, I'm giving in. I said, okay, that's fair. A few months go by and I see her again and I said, how do you like it? She said, well, I'm starting to sing. I'm starting to sing. And she wrote me this email and just talking about what God has done in her life. And, and she said, next came my baptism. And wow, I struggled with this one for a long time. But by continuing to come to church and hearing the same messages consistently and with the guidance of people there and the Holy Spirit was able to break down these walls. And when I walked into that pool, I was literally trembling. But all the people around me helped soothe my soul. When I signed up to help at the welcome table in the theater, this is really when my walk grew. I, it was so nice to be able to meet so many people and see familiar faces and answer questions to a newbie and be able to tell my perspective from someone who is quite jaded over religion. Over the years, I've enjoyed all that God's done here in his church. The people, the service, the opportunity to give back at my own comfort level. From divorce care, greeting, nursery, feed my starving children, JMI Gala, I'm filled with such warmth and gratitude and so blessed to have walked through life together. What God is doing at Rolling Hills makes a difference. Today, during the service, I spent time reading some on the worship guide that I grab every week, but today I focused on the back of it, and I can 100% declare that our vision, our mission, and our core values are true, and I've had the privilege to witness each one. Thank you, church, for answering God's call 15 years ago. It's made a difference to me, to me. Guys, I just think about this, that Jesus took these disciples back then and they could have easily said, wow, it's just about us and they could have come together and had a little holy huddle and, but they didn't. They turned around and just looked around and said, hey, how can I love the people around me? And maybe it's an invitation to a basketball tournament or a football game or invitation to church. But he took 11 men and changed the world and what could he do through us? See, I want to ask you and just challenge you and encourage you in this is that, you know what? The Apostle Paul was willing to reach out to others, and are we? We can never grow complacent or comfortable, but we must be willing to change for the sake of the gospel. 
We must be willing to change. So what is God calling you to do? What difference is God calling you to make? And maybe for you, it's just looking around and praying for your neighbors or praying for your family or praying and just saying, God, if you can use me, here I am. And maybe for you, it's sponsoring a child or going on a mission trip or maybe for you, it's foster care or adoption. I don't know. But I know this, this is our time. God has stewarded us with this time in history and may he find us faithful. I wanna ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. Where are you today? Maybe right now you can just say, thank you, God, for the people who invested in me. Maybe right now just to say, God, what are you calling me to do? Maybe even as we're talking this morning, God's put somebody on your heart. Maybe it's inviting them to church or maybe it's a spiritual conversation. Maybe it's sending an email or a text. Maybe God's calling you to take a next step and to go on a mission trip, sponsor a child. Maybe it's not this year, but maybe next. But God's called all of us to be engaged in what he's doing in this world. So Father God, here we are, your disciples. Thank you, thank you for Jesus and the hope that we have in Christ. And Father, I pray that it wouldn't just be about us, but because we've been changed and transformed, God, that we would look around and we would say, I just wanna tell you what God's doing in my life. I'm not perfect, but I'm so excited and so thankful and so grateful. Father, I know it starts at home, and so I pray, Father, a blessing over our families our extended families, Father, that we would love well, that we would read your word, that we would point people to you. Father, in our workplace, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, and then to the ends of the earth. We love you, Father, and we dedicate our lives to you. This is your church, and we are your people. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.